Well, first off, my name is Ashley Priest. I'm uh, one of the founders of Cascadia Labs, and uh, so Veda, uh, as well as um, Portland Chapter Woman Grow. Um, thank you. Um, so, Team Cannabis, uh, I haven't seen this film yet. That's how elite it is. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but I know some really badass women who are in the film, featured in the film, and I know Wendy Borman, who um, is the powerhouse. <laughs> 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 um, and I can again speak for the other women who helped bring Wendy's film here in that um, there are some pillars of responsibility that we have that Wendy highlights, and that's social justice sustainability, and our own power to take acknowledgement for the actions we make every day. Um, and you can kind of use your imagination on those three pillars and what that means and how you can utilize your daily practices and, and the conversations and the situations you have within your own businesses and relationships uh, to attain those three responsibilities. <clears throat> um, so first off, uh, kind of thinking, some really important team players here. Uh, the volunteers, we have seven amazing volunteers who have taken their own time today to come here and show up early and help organize. Again, this is so intricate and I wanna give a big thank you to those seven volunteers. They're kind of sprinkled throughout the crowd and you might be kind of shy about it, but they're amazing, so thank you. Um, I want to thank the media. We have some really amazing media representatives here who, again, have taken time out to um, attend and help, you know, make this come into fruition. So that, too, is volunteer work. Let's, hang, let's say thank you to those people. Um, and there are some really amazing photographers here who have showed up to just simply take beautiful photos, and they're super talented. So thank you for those people attending the show. And Clinton Street Theater for hosting us. Like, so many people are always skeptical of, of supporting the cannabis industry. So Clinton Street, thank you. And dots across the street for the after party. Make sure if you have enough time to just, even if it's stop in and say hello, please do that. Thank you, dots, for offering your space. Uh, and then we have some really amazing in-kind sponsors who did some small things but make a big impact. So Ready, Print, and Shop, they did all these beautiful brochures with all the colors. Um, it's amazing. That stuff costs a lot, so those little things are really helpful. So thank you, Ready. Um, and then the collective right up front here, they did some really amazing like video coverage. Um, of the, some of the panelists and the women responsible for bringing this uh, event to Portland. So thank you, the Hood Collective, for helping me out. I really appreciate it. Um, and now to the people who helped so much financially. This was a big endeavor. I, again, we had no idea of what it was like to bring a film uh, to the audience and there is so much that's involved. We could not have made this happen with all of our volunteer time without these sponsors. It is huge that they helped out, and if it wasn't for their help, this wouldn't be here. So I'm gonna take a moment again to go down a, a little list of those people. Um, Empower, Empower Body Care produces high quality cannabinoid infused topical products in an effort to reduce the use of harmful pharmaceuticals and to change the hearts and minds about the cannabis plant. So, great big thank you to Empower Body Care by Label Black Label. Um, the Battery Group. Um, the Battery Group advances equal access to capital for primarily for females, minorities, and LGBTQ groups and founders. Thank you. Emerge Law with Greenbridge. Emerge is a full service law firm bringing big firm experience to the cannabis industry nationally. Emerge recently merged with California's premier cannabis business law firm, Greenbridge Corporation Council, and they operate as one law firm. So thank you to Emerge. Uh, Greenleaf Lab, which 
I'm sure everybody knows of Greenleaf Lab and their amazing work over their, like almost a decade yeah, of yeah. time. Uh, they are one of the women-owned full-service cannabis testing labs serving the state of Oregon since 2011. Hands down. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, New Cannabis is All Natural. Uh, and they have a mission to set free the power of therapeutic cannabis. Thank you to New Cannabis. <laughs> the Caputo Group, uh, it's locally owned and family run business that is passionate about providing comprehensive business solutions, speci business solutions specializing whew, in helping businesses grow and thrive. And it's been actively engaged in the cannabis industry, supporting local organizations and providing educational workshops. So check them out. They're, they're pretty awesome. Canamami, which is my passion for nonprofits. Canamami is a California based nonprofit providing safe access to all natural medicines by supporting mothers in accessing THC, CBD, and naked products in education. They advocate for mothers' rights to choose plants over pills, so thank you, Kanamami. <laughs> for a nonprofit to provide to, a, to a, an event like this is really amazing, too, so shout out to nonprofit orgs doing, yeah. doing work like this. Uh, and the Weed Blog. The Weed Blog is the number one website for cannabis news and information and serves as the cannabis authority for the Maven Coalition Network. The company's mission is to be a vehicle for cannabis law reform and policy change in hopes of providing education and building community that will eventually end cannabis prohibition on a global level. So thank you to the Weed Blog. Uh, so data. So Veda utilizes ancient Ayurveda wisdom to create plant medicine for a soulful lifestyle in the incubation of uh, launch midsummer. So stay tuned, please. Thank you so much. <laughs> and last but not least, Tokativity. I'm sure we all know exactly who Tokativity is. Um, I'm going to let Samantha Montero go ahead and give the presentation for Tokativity. She's the founder and o owner of Prison House and also the co-creator of Tokativity. So, Sam. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. What? Hi, Hi shoes. Sam. Sparkle shoes? shoes? Are they looking good up here? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm really honored to be a part. I just want to acknowledge my business partner, Lisa, who took the reins on this, because I have like four other events this week with other things, and Lisa spearheaded this with Tokativity, and I'm honored to be along this ride with such an empowering and amazing woman, so thank you. Um, for those of you who don't know what Tokativity is, Tokativity is now the worldwide community for women. We are based in Portland, Oregon, and Tokativity was created by Lisa Snyder and I in 2016 with an intention to create safe spaces for women to connect, learn, and to create. Tokativity bridges the gap between the industry and consumer by connecting women in person and online. We aim to empower women from the root level. Whether they are a curious first-time consumer or a regular user or patient, we really aim to provide spaces for women to learn and to connect on deeper levels to help push the cannabis movement forward. Tokativity Connect is our new online social platform offering forums, an online classroom, business listings, and so much more, job listings, all kinds of things. Uh, Facebook is over and Tokativity <laughs> Connect is in. So um, Lisa developed this herself. We've been working on this for about a year. Go to tokativity.com slash connect to make your profile. Up here we have 50% business, uh, off business membership. Our first advertisement that we ran um, had something like 180,000 impressions in within a couple weeks. Um, Lisa's an amazing SEO woman. So we're looking to connect with other businesses that want to reach a worldwide audience. and. Um, be sure to check out tokativity.com for our upcoming events. Thank you so much. It's really an honor to be here. I'm so proud to be a woman of weed. Thank you, Samantha. Um, and with that being
being said, let's introduce the panelists. So we're going to take some a little bit of time with the panel and some questions to the amazing women that are in the film and the amazing woman that brought the film here. And I'm going to give them a quick introduction, and they'll each come up as I introduce them. So um, first, first, we're going to introduce some, or excuse me, Lisa Snyder. Um, Lisa is the moderator tonight, and she is a cannabis and women's rights activist a web developer and online strategist and the co-creator of Tobativity, a cannabis community for women, as we heard. She has worked on the web since the mid-90s, holy moly, and has created and organized feminist events since 2005. So Lisa, can you please come up? Next, we are inviting the woman of the night, Wendy Borman. I don't know how much I can say except Wendy, the director and filmmaker of Mary Jane, The Women of Weed. We have the woman in the house. Um, a round of applause again for her. Thank you, Wendy. We truly appreciate it. Um, and I don't think I need to give too much description because I feel like the film is really going to like touch on all those points that I don't, you know, we have a whole hour to do that. All right. So uh, the next person, Madeline Martinez, if you can please come up. <laughs> I don't know if I have enough time in the night to give you the gratitude that you deserve. So I'm going to stick to like the, the major things because I could go on and on and on about you. Yes. Madeline is the executive director and board member of Oregon Normal, uh, as well as Normal Women's Alliance chair. Madeline, thank you. Yes. She's also owner of the world famous Cannabis Cafe. Amazing. Thank you, Madeline. Uh, next we have Sarah Battery. Sarah, can you please come to the Sarah is the founder of the Battery Group, and the Battery Group is to advance e equal access to capital for primarily for females, minorities, and LGBT founders. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Next we have Leah Maurer. Leah is co-owner of the We Blog, where she serves as the editorial lead. She's a cannabis activist who founded a group called Moms for Yes on Measure 91 in 2014, and she helped advocate for and pass the legalization measure here in Oregon. So thank you, Leah. And last, but certainly not least, we have Trista Oko. Trista Oko. She's the founder and CEO of Empower, Empower Body Care. She started the company in 2013 in order to help people reduce their use of pharmaceuticals to address pain and inflammation. That is like the very start of the organization. For the last 14 years, Trista has had the pleasure of changing hearts and minds about cannabis each time someone who wouldn't normally use cannabis gets relief from one of her products. So, thank you. With that, I'm going to pass the mic to the panelists. How's everybody doing? <laughs> Anybody stoned right now? <laughs> okay, some hands. Okay, later. That's for later. Okay, well, I'm really glad that you're here. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I really feel super proud to be here with all of you tonight. Um, this has been like a long time in the making, definitely for Wendy. He's been working on this film for over two years. And it was a little bit after two years, a, little, about a year and a half, where I found the, um, the little postcard and I was like, I need to reach out to Wendy and um, see what's up. She wasn't even done making the film yet. So she's like, I'm doing a lot of stuff. And that's why we ready for a while. So here we are. Today is the day. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so um, my first question is actually to Wendy. Um, so you've put a lot of effort into making sure that this film gets a lot of visibility. What was, um, why was it important to you to make this film? Well, without giving away too much of what you're going to see in the movie, um, 
I moved to Colorado in 2014, and that was right when a legal adult sales for cannabis were happening. But I was not a cannabis consumer. I had actually never tried cannabis before. Um, so I didn't really pay too much mind to it until I started hearing about all the success that women were having in the industry. And at the time, the statistic was 36% of senior leadership in the cannabis industry was women. And that made me perk up a little bit because we know the national average is 22%, and then there's other industries like finance, or my industry, which is film, it's even worse, it's 12%. So I was, as a journalist, my like journalist spidey senses kind of peaked up. I was like, hmm, why are women coming to cannabis? That's interesting. And then I started talking to people and I realized that cannabis was also the intersection of social justice and environmental sustainability. And those three core values, when you add gender parity, had been present in all my other work. So, that became this movie, which you'll see. Um, but by the time the film came out on the film festival circuit last fall, the statistic for women in cannabis had actually fallen to 27%. And that's over the course of 18 months. So the call to action for the film became a lot stronger. So Gina Davis has this saying that if you can see it, you can be it. And I really believe that if we show diverse, amazing women who are the experts in their field, that's going to inspire more women to come in to the industry. And we really need everyone. I mean, you can look at these dismal statistics and go, oh, I guess that's not really a place for me. But we actually need you more. So that became really important. And I'll also throw in that one of the most courageous things we can do as women is to tell our stories. And so if I can be a part of helping you tell your stories and be a vehicle to elevate, elevate and celebrate the women who are walking the walk, I feel like I won the lottery and I have the best job in the world. <laughs> access to legal cannabis, uh, medical cannabis, and recreational. And um, this sort of brings me to, to Madeline. I have a question for you. Um, so you've been in the industry for a really long time. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it really don't. When it was just a marijuana movement, right. then all of a sudden it was an industry right from my very eyes. Um, what barriers do women of color face in the cannabis industry? You know, I am a different woman of color. I ended up opening the world famous Cannabis Cafe in 2009. And, but, and doing, actually, uh, that was a move that only white privileged men generally made. And so when I did it, I heard some banjo music in the background. Uh, not all the guys were on board. They weren't real pleased about the fact that this little Mexican lady that came uh, straight from California decided she was gonna make a difference. And uh, I opened this cafe only because people were looking for a place to consume out of public view so they wouldn't violate their OMMP card. And uh, that's what happened. I, uh, I had a little something written here to talk about it because uh, one of the things that I'm really honored to be, thank you, congratulations, Wendy. Oh my goddess, I never thought it was gonna be this big. This big, I really didn't. She contacted me so early to say, hey, you opened the world famous cannabis cafe and we wanna work on gender parity. Well, that is something I love and near and dear to my heart. So, um, you know, I said my congratulations. What a brilliant idea to create and direct this groundbreaking documentary. I am honored to be both a woman of weed and a puffer jet. For me, it is profound to be called a puffragette, a word derived from, the, from suffragettes. Um, in uh, 2007, I won the Pauline Sabin Award. Pauline Sabin was a woman that spearheaded the end of alcohol prohibition. Suffragettes, yes, suffragettes were the women that suffered to bring the end of alcohol prohibition to us. And in 2000, I mean, I'm sorry, in 1970, so long ago, that uh, Keith, Keith Straw founded the National 
organization for uh, the national, <laughs> the national, <laughs> the national organization for the reform of marijuana laws. But he used the template that was set forth by Pauline Sabin, which was the Women's National Organization for the End of Prohibition. And so I don't know that. It's the right word. I'm a little buzzed. But um, <laughs> a tequila, I'm a real lightweight. So um, I just came from um, Chicago for an equity summit, which was amazing. I go to a, a normal conference, and all you see is white men and some white women. You never see Mexicans and blacks. Now they're starting to come. They're starting to come out because everything's changed. You know, you see a brown person and leading an organization like Oregon Normal for nine years, and we built quite an organization, 3,000 members, and that's what a woman can do, and that's what a person of color can do. We gave away over 200 times a month to people, and some of you in this audience remember the days. I know James is over here, and he's got one of the biggest farms, and he started with one of our companies. So, we are historic and we made a huge difference. And Wendy, I'm so grateful to you for putting this out there and for letting people know that it doesn't matter who you are, be the change that you want to see. And always remember, to stand in the face of injustice and be silent is to be a co-conspirator. I will not be silent. It's not magic. It's a skill set. It's a simple, tactical skill set that if you spend your career as I did in finance, raising money for startups, you just do it in the same way the rest of you know how to manage your books or clone your plants or do any of the other things. It's something that you can learn how to do. And nobody's talking about it that way. And we're all stuck in the blame game. You know, it's white guys' fault because they don't give women money. And it's, you know, it's you know, it's everybody's fault, and it's not. Like what I'm trying to do is address a simple problem with a simple solution and teach women how to raise money because I think that's the answer. Some women, I don't know, Tristy, blow my mind. You haven't raised money ever, right? No. <laughs> Badass. Like she's building. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I've raised a lot of money. I've spent a lot of money, and like, ouch. But 
You know, it's not always the best thing to do, but knowing how to do it, if you, if you feel like you, you can raise money when you need to, your entire landscape changes, You've, your possibilities change, you, you, your goals become completely different. And so I think women have huge challenges raising money, but I think the only thing that we can really do anything about as women is to make sure that we are equipped with the skills that we need and we have access to the information that we need. And I will teach anyone how to do this. Like, it, it's not, all you need to know is it's not fucking rocket science, right? <laughs> um, you can do it, it's a skill set that you can learn. And what I'm working to do is try to make those educational tools more available. And I'm focusing that attention on women, minorities, and people in the LGBT community, but just because they've got a lot of catching up to do in terms of access to capital. Um, but guys need this too. Raising money is something that everyone needs to know how to do if they're gonna build a business. So that's really where it's at for me. Thank you. because of my life experiences, but really part of the industry since 2015. Okay. Um, how has advocacy helped, um, for, how have you seen um, or been a part of being an advocate in the cannabis industry and, and seen what advocacy can do for the forward movement of cannabis? That's a really good question, and it's something that I try to drive home to people all the time. Um, being like on the ground during Measure 91 and when that was happening and seeing the companies that supported Measure 91 that not just said, yes, I'm voting yes, but that said, I'm voting yes and I'm going to volunteer for you and give you money and really try to get this passed because this is the third one that's been on the ballot in six years at this point in Oregon and we want to have legal weed here. Those brands are ones that are some of the staples in the Oregon industry today. The two that come to mind the most for me are Pure Green and Oregon. And those people gave a ton of money. Yeah, you can clap for them because it's awesome what they did for all of them. Like if you think about where Oregon would be, I mean, in 2014, on a non-presidential election year, we passed that. It was like a six or seven percent margin. That's huge for a non-presidential election year to get that many people to get out and vote yes on something that's controversial like cannabis. So I feel like advocacy really needs to be at the forefront of what everyone is doing. And I know we live in the Portland bubble here, but you know, being one of the owners of the Weed Blog where I get outreach from people all the time that are like, I live in Oklahoma, I live in Georgia, I live in a non-legal state and I just want access for my you know, sick wife or sick cousin or grandmother or something like that, and it's absolutely heartbreaking, you know? And then you have people like myself who own a media, you know, who own an a online publication where, and I haven't shared this with my co-event hosts yet, but we tried to throw some money uh, to Facebook today on a sponsored post for this, and we are officially banned from doing ads on Facebook now. Um, because of advertising for a film, an educational documentary event. So I feel like that says it right there. And any of you that have had to like, you know, that are in the industry here that have to wiggle through like online payment platforms or anything like that, like even if you're having success there, the stigma still exists. So breaking down the stigma and keeping advocacy at the forefront until this whole wheel gets pushed all the way forward and cannabis prohibition ends in this country and we can have, you know, testing standards, you know, and all the other industry standards and, and laws and everything like that not be a patchwork and actually be something that's uniform across the line where we can operate like any other industry. It's going to continue to be like this. So I, I feel like, and I, and I tell other legal, you know, states that are looking at legalizing and that ask for consulting on initiatives and stuff like that, that it's absolutely so important to anyone who wants to be involved in the industry that's going to follow to be involved in the advocacy to begin with because it's good for the movement, it's good for, it's good for um, the policy, and it's good for the industry when it comes out and it will indeed create, like, we have Greenleaf Lab. 
they were, they were huge. I mean, 2011, like there's a lot of, of people that you can see that are established in this industry. And unless you dig into the history of those companies, you won't see that they did, that they were actually a part of that emerging industry and that, you know, the policy change and everything. So very important. One tour for Trista. Are you ready? <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, so my first question to you is, how did you decide that you wanted to be in the industry, in the legal market? And two is, what kind of barriers um, do queer women face in the cannabis industry? Oh, those are both good questions. Okay, so how did I decide I wanted to be in the industry? Um, back in 2004, um, I was doing a lot of uh, activism and advocacy for um, the marijuana movement. Um, I don't know, how, how many of you guys know the story of how Empower started? Anybody? Look at that. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> All right, so I'll make it really quick. Um, I was volunteering with Americans for Safe Access. It was 2004. Um, we were lobbying uh, Congress that year um, with the Marijuana Policy Project. And uh, 14 of us with Americans for Safe Access, aka ASA, uh, decided to um, participate in a direct action where we s sat on the steps of Health and Human Services with a banner um, with all of the names of the doctors that we knew of at that time. Uh, it was thousands uh, who had recommended cannabis for m medical use uh, to their patients. And because and the whole reason for this direct action was to um, bring attention to the fact that the federal government refuses to reschedule <laughs> cannabis, right? Anyway, so we were arrested on purpose and spent six glorious hours in D.C. jail where they didn't even close the door, the, the, the jail cell. Um, <laughs> I called it activist jail. <laughs> uh, but while we were sitting there, um, we had a really lively conversation about uh, the suffragette movement, which happened during the same 20 year period as women both started and ended alcohol prohibition. And it became abundantly clear to me that women were the key to um, moving the movement forward. It had gotten to a certain point and we couldn't, you know, we couldn't get the vote over 50% at, at that point. Um, so that's where I thought of Empower. Um, and it's End Marijuana Prohibition, Organize Women, and Act Reform. Now, <laughs> However, women were also the biggest barrier to, to cannabis uh, prohibition ending at that time. <laughs> um, women are, were worried about losing their kids. They were worried about their kids uh, becoming addicted to cannabis or using it too young. Um, and they were worried about the stigma attached, right? So uh, the, the best way that I could figure to be um, effective in my advocacy work was to combine my passion for helping my mom, who um, deals with three forms of arthritis, broken back, um, a bunch of other, uh, sorry, it, <laughs> it gets me a little bit. Um, helping mom deal with her pain um, and keep her off of <coughs> the pharmaceuticals, uh, we were able to bring her with, with uh, this all does circle back around, don't worry. Um, we were able to bring her pain levels from an eight to a three um, using topical products uh, that I created, and at the same time, I decided that using the word empower for that company would be the best way that I could actually make change, and the best way to change the hearts and minds of people who would never usually use cannabis, right? Um, topical products, you know, don't enter the bloodstream, they don't make you feel high, so it seemed like, and also women are the biggest buyers of body care products, right? So mm -hmm. it just made sense to put, it in, to put my energies into um, creating and growing a business that would actually help further the advocacy. So that's why I do what I do. I guess that was the question. Yeah. <laughs> now, regarding being a, a gay woman and a queer woman in the industry, um, it's not as hard as it used to be, but it, it used to be pretty difficult. Um, especially if you look gay. <laughs> Just saying. My beautiful wife Michelle is in the audience and she doesn't really deal with it that much. <laughs> but she does wear the pants. But anyway. Um, Oregon and 
Southern Oregon um, runs. Because uh, <laughs> I did all of my own sales for the first three years. And um, doing those runs sometimes by myself was sometimes scary, actually. And, you know, sometimes I didn't get my products into somebody's store and I could tell why, you know. Um, that said, I killed them with kindness. And <laughs> some of the big, biggest advocates for Empower now are people who've made some pretty disparaging comments about gay people, actually, which is kind of ironic, but also makes me happy. <laughs> <laughs> so there's some barriers, but I think that um, with the right personality and perseverance, obviously anybody can overcome anything. To know you too. <laughs> I just want to know, like you know, I just want to know you, and um, I, you know, just experiencing. Uh, I don't. I, mean, I have these gay glasses and all that stuff, but you know, I'm, I'm still am I identifying. But um, a little bit. You know, <laughs> yeah, got the glasses. Um, <laughs> so um, you know, just one note about this is that you know there. I know that. Um, like sex sells, but you know, you don't have to be like this overly sexy woman to, you know, be, to own your business and to, you know, use that to sell. So I just want to put that up. <laughs> to Wendy. Um, so this is, I just, I'm really curious about barriers because they're everywhere for women. Um, so as a female filmmaker, what was the most challenging part about making this film? And did you have any barriers that you had to um, move through? Yes and no. Um, so thankfully, this is my third documentary. So I had a leg to stand on when I started doing the fundraising, right? So I had a positive track record with my other projects. Um, and yet I still got pushback when we were fundraising. I mean, there was even a female investor I was talking to and she was like, but why are you doing about women? <laughs> and my response was, why not? We're 50% of the population. We're less than 33% of the speaking roles. Why wouldn't I do a film about women? We need to fix that. She didn't give me any money. <laughs> and I fine-tuned my answer to that question. <laughs> but, but just proving that we as women are a worthy subject for a film was an obstacle, right? And I just find that frustrating. This was before the Me Too and the Time's Up movement. You know, we were primarily doing our fundraising in 2015 and 2016. So um, that was a challenge. Um, it's also really interesting who speaks up or requests to do a film screening. You know, there are some film festivals who we find somebody who's a big advocate in their organization. They're like, can I get a screener? I want to show it to everybody. We're definitely going to make this happen. And then they have to send me kind of an embarrassed email going, I'm really sorry we showed it to the rest of the festival and you didn't make the cut. So there's people still out there who are trying to prevent even the conversation about cannabis or women in cannabis. So that said, like everything's an opportunity. And when people do see the film, as you do tonight, and I want to hear your responses after at the after party, but there's something magical that happens. You know, I've been at screenings where particularly women who have been skeptical come up to me afterwards and they're like, I'm finally gonna go get a topical for my arthritis. <laughs> or I'm gonna take my mom into a dispensary because I really want her to start using something instead of all the pharmaceutical and stuff. And we're, we're changing those, those hearts and those minds, right? So my hope is that a lot of the great advocacy work that has come before this film can continue. Because there are, I know there are people who, if people didn't know what they were watching, they might watch this movie and learn something, right? You know, we've got the can of curious people here, but um, ultimately we're an indie film, right? So our marketing is all word of mouth, you know, social media or just telling people who you know, and you guys are the mouths. So if you like this movie or if you like 
this conversation and want to take it to the next level, or if you want to recommend it to people, please do. Our website is maryjanesfilm.com, and we're on, even though Facebook is dying, I guess, um, we're still on. <laughs> um, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, we're at Mary Jane's Film. Thank you. I'm just wondering how much time we have left. Five more minutes. Um, okay, so maybe we can just go down the line here, um, starting with Madeline. Um, what do you feel is necessary? What kind of, actually, let, let's rewind for a second. What steps do we as a community need to be taking to help reduce barriers for women? Well, I think that we all have to just move forward and let people know how empowered we are. You know, I came from that Chicago summit, and I want to say that for me, I claim our power, our future, and our industry, because that's what it's going to take. Unfortunately, a lot, a lot of women ask me, how did you do it? What did you do about being around all these white gentlemen that they really don't want you around. I say you stand your ground, you stand shoulder to shoulder with them, and you do not let them stop you. If they say, you know what, you can't do it, just say, why? They said, you can't open the cannabis cafe. And I said, why not? They said, well, because they're not going to let you. And I said, they who? <laughs> and I said, they said, well, the law. And I said, I don't think they're going to stop me. I already, you know, I was really stoned. <laughs> Shocking, right? I went online and I bought Cannabis Cafe. I just bought it uh, at the State of Oregon Secretary of State's office. And then I thought, oh shit, what am I gonna do now? And then I just kept going and I just didn't let anybody stop me. They told me I couldn't do legislation. And now Lee Berger, prominent Portland um, attorney, said, he called me the other day and he's on stage, the mother of 1085. And I don't know how many of you know what 1085 is, but it changed the law from three ounces of stored marijuana per patient to 24 ounces of stored marijuana per patient. And now I'm that much, okay? I think you want to say pleasure too, but I just say stand your ground, don't let them stop you, don't let them intimidate you because that's what they've been doing forever. They stand there and they go, well, I'm a white man and you're not going to be able to do it. Watch me, okay? Watch me. And now they all come to me and they're like, what did you do? How did you do that? Because I stood my ground to you, all right? Because I stood up. And that's what you all have to do. And that's what I would encourage every woman to do. Don't back down. That's funny, the last thing you said is like, when people said to you, what did you do? How did you do it? I think that, I think the answer's in that. People started to ask me that way back, back in like 2015 and, and to, all through 2016 when I started to raise money. Uh, I was one of the founders of Hyper Farms and I was raising money and it was going great. And people were like, what are you doing? How are you doing that? And I'm like, what am I doing? How am I doing that? Like, what am I doing? And then people were like, well, will you talk to us about it? And I'm like, sure. i got to figure out what I'm doing. <laughs> so I can talk to other people about it. And then when I started talking to other people about it, I was like, well, I'm not going to fucking get up here and talk about leadership and women. I'm going to tell you what to do. I'm just going to tell you what to do. So I created a workshop. And then that workshop evolved and it became a sort of a curriculum, a methodology, and at this point it's this really concise teaching tool for doing this thing. And it all started with people saying to me, how are you doing that? What did you do? How did you do it? And I decided to take that question and turn it into something that I could share with people that might be useful to them. And I think that's what you said also, and I think that's a really powerful thing. So if anyone ever comes up to you and says, how are you doing that? What are you doing? Then realize that you're doing something special and figure out how to teach it to the people around you who need support in that area. Oh, barriers. Um, 
Um, I say climb those barriers, and I feel like one of the biggest things, something that I feel is really special about what sort of happened in Oregon is the sort of coalition building and unity that's happened with various, you know, maybe not the whole industry, but various sectors of the industry and things like that. I'm, I'm huge on, you know, uniting people and building coalitions and that being a big piece of how to get past those barriers because power in numbers, right? More voices than one always helps things. So I think that, you know, by being here tonight and doing things like this, and attending things like Tokativity and going to other events that are like these, that is one of the best ways you can like get past those barriers because you can talk with other people that have had successful companies and things like that and get advice from them and talk with them about it and also, you know, at the same time get other ideas for yourself. So I think that really, you know, that there are a lot of barriers out there, but we have to all keep in mind that this is an emerging industry. You know, we are never going to see another one of these in our lifetime. My children will probably see another one, never see another one of these. And that's huge for what we have the capability to do here. And one of the reasons that, like, this film is so powerful is because the, the tenets that it puts out there, you know, gender parity, environmental sustainability, social justice, those are all things that the cannabis industry can really take the lead in. And I feel really good about where we're at in Oregon with being able to be a leader, potentially on the global level with this. Yeah. Barriers. What's a barrier, right? <laughs> <laughs> an opportunity. I mean, so I guess the first thing that we can all do is support um, each other and support women-owned companies. Um, I think that's a really big part of <coughs> making sure that women-owned companies continue to uh, stay alive and thrive. Um, Secondly, I think it's really important that if you see something as a barrier in front of you, to just push through it, <laughs> you know? I mean, or climb it, you know? Trump built a wall, just climb over, over it. <laughs> no big deal. <laughs> um, no, I'm kidding, I'm memorizing for real. It's actually really difficult. <laughs> so, but, um, yeah, I mean, look, look to those who have pushed through the barriers already, um, ask questions, um, take your vision and work backwards. And I think that's a really good tool to use. Uh, a long time ago, I, not a long time ago, a while ago, um, did anybody ever watch Weeds? Yes. yes. So you remember the last episode? Yes. yes. Where you see this, you know, awesome cannabis cafe, essentially. Um, and, and there, what's that? Sorry, get that anyway. Um, so, take your vision, work backwards. I think that's the best way to get through barriers. I just want to let all of you know that on Saturday, May the 5th, we'll be having our Global Cannabis March through downtown Portland. We're going to be meeting at high noon at Pioneer Courthouse Square. Please join us as we continue to fight. We've been doing this for like 20 years. So come out and show your cannabis pride, please. to invest in women-owned companies. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a position to do that, and you just have questions about how do I do that, talk to any of us, specifically Sarah. She can kind of walk you through that. Um, the, the other thing is as consumers, right, let's vote with our dollars. So shop at the women-owned dispensaries, buy products from women and people of color who are in, making it an in industry. That's how we can keep great products like Empower on the shelves, right? Um, and lastly, if mentorship. So if 
we can't be happy with just one diverse space in the boardroom. That's not how we're going to achieve parity. So if you're in a position where you find yourself in leadership, make sure that we reach back down and help the next generation through mentorship and education so they have a seat at the table with us. Amen. So one way we can, we can help normalize this conversation is we're going to do an Instagram contest tonight, everybody. <laughs> um, so there are Puffragette temporary tattoos. You've probably been seeing people wear it. We have extras at the front table, and we'll have some more out. If, um, so what you do to en enter the contest, you're going to put the tattoo on. That's the first thing. So, little demo, take the plastic off. Okay. Maybe people haven't done this. So take the plastic off the paper. Step one, okay? You're then gonna put the color part on your skin, and if you need a wet paper towel or napkin or something like that, and you put that on top of the paper, okay, that says Mary Jane's. Leave it for 15 to 20 seconds, and when you can peel the paper off, that means it's on your skin, all right? So you got your tattoo on, that's step number one. You're then going to take a photo and post it on Instagram. The way you enter into the contest is tag at Mary Jane's film and use the hashtag Pufferjet, okay? And when you do this, put an amazing photo and a caption, let us know what it means to you to be a Pufferjet and what you, can, you have entered in to win Two tickets to the Cult Classic on May 12th. Yes. Yes. So it's going to be open for 24 hours. So if you are really inspired and want to post your photo tonight, awesome, do it. But 24 hours from now is when we shut it down. So if you need to go home, you want to like art direct something fabulous, <laughs> really get into the zone, you can totally do that too. Awesome. That's a pretty sweet deal. It's like. $40 a ticket, so yeah. I want everybody to enter. I want to see all the pictures up on Instagram. You can tag Tokativity and any of the women's own businesses here. That's a great way to shout them out. Um, so let's give a hand to our panelists.